2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is our text. I'm going to give you on the front end the Christian prepositions we're going to talk about. I'll tell them to you now so that if we don't make it through the message, you can go home and do your own message. <laughs> it's this, the word in, that is a preposition. I remember when I was in, I guess, about the fifth or sixth grade, you had to memorize these prepositions. There was about 80 of them. It was a chore. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but I still remember them. I board about above, across, after, along, the mid, among. All those things, it just goes and goes and goes. Those are good to know. In the Bible, here's the prepositions you need to know. In Christ. That's an important one. How about this one? With Christ. By Christ. And for Christ. Those all have great meanings and they're something special to Christians. In 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 17. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. I can see we are not going to finish this, this today. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's that in Christ. <coughs> so this is something special. Not everybody is in Christ. However, if you're saved, you're in him. And to that man he's saying this, He is a new creature. Now a perplex, perplexing little phrase here. Because we read this, we quote this, but we don't think about it, and if we do, we probably don't believe it. He says, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Really? Have all your old things passed away? Has everything become new to you once you got saved? That's a tough verse if you think about it. So question yourself, are you saved? <laughs> I'm not trying to get retreads here, but I am trying to explain the verse. He says, notice what he said, old things. There are some old things when you get saved that cease to exist. For instance, you are no longer in a, uh, the a devil no longer has authority over you. You're not in bondage to him anymore. That's an old thing that's passed away. What will replace it is a new thing. See the last part? All things are become new. The new things that have passed away have been replaced with something new. Now the verse works, doesn't it? Everything that the devil had for you, God has much better when you get saved and you've got a better replacement. It's a new thing. Let's notice this, li uh, this living in Christ. That's salvation. In Ephesians 2.10 he says this, <clears throat> For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's that phrase again. <clears throat> now, we're not just created in Christ Jesus because he wanted to see if he could do it. <laughs> he wasn't just experimenting one day. No, our creation in Christ Jesus is for a purpose. He says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Not that Christ is waiting on you to come up with some good works. That makes you the creator. No, He's going to create the good works through you, not you do them. He says, created unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. It's God who does the works, not us. But the reason he made us a new creature in Christ is because he wants to do it through us. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, he says this, For as in Adam all die, even so, here's our phrase, in Christ shall all be made alive. If you're in Christ, you're alive. Now this is something the world does not understand. There's life in Christ the world doesn't know anything about. Now, as a Christian, we should enjoy, I'm going to use the world's phrase, life. <laughs> but we have the true meaning of life. So truly, we should enjoy it. The thing about most Christians is they don't know where their life comes from and they're looking to the grave to get life out of it and they don't understand why they're not enjoying this. Well, you've been playing with a dead corpse. No wonder you don't enjoy it. I mean, that's hazardous to your health <laughs> in more ways than one. Okay, that's in Christ. Let's see another one. Living with Christ. That's fellowship. Look at it in 1 John. 1 John 1. 1 John 1 good chapter to memorize 
I'm going to take this practically. Of course, 1 John doctrinally is tribulation. First John 1. <clears throat> that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. What is it you've heard? You heard words, right? Word. <laughs> which we have seen. The word you could see, that would be the word incarnate. With our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. The capital word of life. If you have life, it's only from one place. Jesus Christ is the Word. Our life is connected directly to the Word. Outside of the Word of God, even if you're saved, you don't feel like you're living. Your life is stagnant. He says in verse 3, <clears throat> That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also might have, here's our word, fellowship with us. <clears throat> now it's important in this Christian life to have good fellowship. <clears throat> I know it's not always possible with man. Sometimes you look around and what you have to draw from for fellowship is pretty, pretty bad news and you don't want to fellowship much with it. Well, the most important fellowship you can have is with God. If you'll get that one right, He'll open a door for you to have a human to fellowship with. Now, where people get in trouble is when they try to reverse the process. If you try to fellowship with man to the exclusion of God, God will be sure you have no qualified candidates to fellowship with. Because he wants to be the one that's important. <coughs> and until you make him important, he doesn't see it as important for you to have somebody else. Oof. You got to stop. I'll, quit. I'll start preaching here in a minute. Verse 4. <coughs> and these things write we unto you, that your joy might be full. There it is. If you want full joy, here's where you know it. You, you physically know the joy is complete when you have this. Jesus Christ as your companion. When you have fellowship and there's nothing between you and he, that feels great. And then when he does the next step and gives you another human that's in this, on the same page, heading the same direction, and the two of you are heading toward God, that is complete joy. You feel it. It's a good thing. He says, verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Okay, you want to know if you're fellowshipping with God? Does your fellowship include darkness? If it includes darkness, it's not of God. Because God's light, he does not have darkness in him. Kick darkness out. The world is full of darkness. You know, we'll never have complete light until we're out of this mess of earth that we're on right now. But you want to get as close to light, I mean clear, godly companionship as you can get. The next thing we'll see is living by Christ. <clears throat> we've seen in Him, and we've seen uh, with Him. Now we'll see by Christ. By Christ, I, I call this fruit bearing or uh, being productive. John chapter 15. John chapter 15, look at verse 5. John 15, 5, he says, I am the true, I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. How, how, do, how do most people live? As doing nothing? You know, that's the American, the new American mentality. I'll sit on the couch and you bring me a paycheck. <laughs> we don't subside that way. We live by a source. It's Jesus Christ. He says, without me, you're not going to produce a thing. You can do nothing. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, he says this. Paul speaking here, he says, of all these men that he's been working with, he says, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Unless God steps in, all our labor is worthless. Doesn't matter. You know, we can't produce anything that's godly for God unless God does it to begin with. <laughs> 
He doesn't count man's works as human, or it, the human works of man as righteous. Unless he's doing it to begin with. Then he'll allow your flesh to move to fulfill his will. And then he counts it. He says in verse 7, So then, neither is it he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. We got too many people running around with clipboards trying to take down tallies of things. Numbers. How many tracts did you pass out? How many people did you talk? How many people did you invite? How many baptisms? How about ask God? How many did He do? Because what you did doesn't impress Him. <laughs> That's what matters. The next thing we'll see is living for Christ. I call this service. 1 Corinthians 3, <clears throat> verse 13. Living for Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 13. He says, Every man's work shall be made manifest. Ooh, that's a scary thought. For the day shall declare it. The day, that's because he's light. You know what happens in the daytime? The lights come on. <laughs> because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Every man's going to receive his own reward according to his own labor. Unfortunately, you can't count on your good friend being uh, the one that pulls the load and you get credit for it. It's not like down here where everybody gets a participation award. <laughs> there, you actually get what you earned the way it should be down here. The main question a man should ask in his daily activities is this, what difference does this make in the light of eternity? We forget that question. Oftentimes, we've got to do certain things down here, and your mind has got to be on certain tasks. But you know what? At some point, the thought should come through, how am I doing this to affect eternity? Even your mundane daily task can be done to benefit you in eternity. If you'll view it as a God-given task and do it as unto the Lord, instead of as unto a task you want to get done, you get credit for it in eternity. It's a good thing. Eternity should always be on our mind. In Psalm 19, he says this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now that tells me that <clears throat> even the words that come out of your mouth and the things you think on in your heart, your meditation, is either acceptable or not acceptable to God. That will count for eternity. Just the thoughts you think. The uh, words you allow to come out of your mouth. Those things God's grading. And those will have a reward in eternity. That's a good deal. You know, it's not these great big things that man gets to see. It's the little things that man can control that he doesn't. Those are the ones that count. In Romans 14, 11, he says this, for, as it, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Who is the himself he's given account of? <laughs> this is an interesting thought. When you get saved, remember, you were bought with a price, you're not your own. Who is the, who, who is the you that is not you? <laughs> Okay, when you get saved, he put his Holy Spirit in you. He cut you free from the flesh, which is still wicked, calls it dead. But there's another member in there, your trinity. That other member in there is the soul. The soul is the director. The soul says, I'll put an ear out for the flesh and I'll put one out for the spirit and I'll decide which one I want to do. That's the you that you are. He says, I don't have time to give you all the information on it, but he says in two places in uh, the Gospels, What shall a prophet of man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Look at it in the book of Luke. He says, What shall, uh, what shall a prophet of man if he shall uh, gain the world and lose his own self? It exchanges the word self for soul. So that tells you the real you is your soul. The soul decides what's going to happen, who you're going to follow. So, the himself you're given account of 
is what your soul allowed or did not at the judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, he says this, For we must all appear. <clears throat> that is, you don't get a choice in the matter. That's very different than what goes on on the earth. Down here, it's <clears throat> if you're going to raise children, you raise them this way, you give them a million choices. And you say, would you like this for breakfast? Here's the things we have. Would you like something that we don't have? We'll go get it. For no, that's not the way I was raised. The way I was raised, <laughs> there's what's for breakfast. Eat it and put a smile on your face or don't and go to your room. <laughs> it was real cut and dry. Now that's the way God is. It says right here, we must all appear. You don't get a choice in the matter. Now, where the choice comes in is this right here. He says that everyone may receive the things done in his body. That is, what you're doing now is where the choice is. One day there will be no choice. You'll be required to appear. And when you appear, he's going to say, what did you do when I wasn't making you do something? <laughs> That's a good one. <clears throat> in Revelation 22, 12, a great verse. <clears throat> Revelation 22, 12, he says this. Behold, I come quickly. Come on. <laughs> now, I know that's been in the Bible for how many years? 2,000 years plus. And we think, how quickly is that? <laughs> 2,000 years? Well, I think that means when he starts moving, it's going to go quick. Because it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye, isn't it? That's the way he moves. He says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. We've got a choice right now. God's coming back. It's not Santa Claus. I'm sorry, the world's got it wrong. But somebody is coming back with a bag of goodies. It's Jesus Christ. And those goodies are based on what we do right now in the flesh. The way we decide whether or not we're doing something right or wrong in the flesh usually is this right here. I'll show it to you in 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 and we're done. 2 Timothy 2 12. Ask yourself as you're going through your day, did I earn anything for eternity today? Did I do anything that's of value? Just remembering that question is hard to do. <laughs> he says in 2 Timothy 2 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It means you lose what you could have had. Because he's wanting to help every one of us get a position in his kingdom. He says if you suffer, you get to reign. But if you won't suffer, you won't reign. <laughs> he's not giving out participation awards. So those are the Christian prepositions that would help us in our day-to-day -day life to count for eternity. They're in Christ, with Christ, by Christ, and for Christ.